So let us pray before we uh, get into God's Word. Thank you, Lord God, for the gift of this house and for the gift of this community. We thank you for Russ's words two weeks ago celebrating the freedom that we have as a people and as a nation to acknowledge you. We thank you for Whitney's words last week reminding us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made by a loving creator. And now, Lord, as we contemplate our redemption in Christ, we pray that you would be pleased to speak to us to rouse our hearts that we might offer you a sacrifice of praise. Amen. So from Psalm 107, follow along. This is, we're reading the first of what are four vignettes in this psalm of thanksgiving to God. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so whom he has redeemed from trouble and gathered in from the lands, from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, especially from the south. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Then they cried to their Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from all their distress. God led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. So let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. For he satisfies the longing soul, and the hungry soul he fills with good things. So man shall not live by bread alone. Well, Hebrews 13 says, through him, that is through Christ, let us continually offer a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that give thanks to His name. Sacrifice of praise. We don't need to make a sacrifice for sin anymore. To come into the presence of a holy God, people would often bring an offering or a sacrifice as a kind of atonement, saying, forgive me, I know I'm unclean, but here accept this gift and therefore accept me. Well, because of the work of Jesus on the cross, who took the sins of the world upon himself, we come into God's presence not needing to make an offering in order to be accepted, but we come in the acceptance that Jesus has won for us on the cross to say, thank you, I praise you, I offer you a sacrifice not of blood, because Christ's blood was enough, but a sacrifice of praise. Now, that's what we're thinking about today, how interesting it is that in worship we gather to make a sacrifice of praise. I know we've talked about this before, and we'll keep on, but it's a sacrifice just to be here. Aren't you glad someone's giving you credit for this? You got up. It's not Wimbledon Sunday. There was no temptation. But you got dressed. You came here. You are sacrificing these hours to be in the company of God's people. Worship requires a sacrifice. One has to focus one's mind mentally. You can't just think about, I shouldn't say it, college football. I lost half of you right there. Boom, a month to go. You've got focused mind. We add heart, the feeling, the intent to our worship. We add voice in our praises. We add connection in our prayers. Worship is a sacrifice of effort and intention and being. It's what God desires most from us. We bring a sacrifice of praise. The atonement is taken care of. What he's longing for is people that acknowledge his name. That's what Psalm 107 is all about. It's a community acknowledgement of who God is. He says, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. It's the community gathering to say, we're going to give thanks to God together. That's why we're here, to give the fruit of lips that praise His name. There's something powerful about being assembled to say, I thank the Lord for my redemption. And together we say, amen. And we say, your redemption is my redemption. Your deliverance is my deliverance. God's work in your life is God's work in all our lives. We are the gathered community giving thanks to Him. So what happens in this psalm is we have four stories. 
of redemption. Four kinds of people represented in the gathering of God's assembly, each of them being called upon to give their thanks. I'd like to run through those with you now. So the first one were the wanderers. Take a look at this passage. Some wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their souls fainted within them. Now, on the surface of it, this sounds like remembering that once all of God's people wandered in the wilderness waiting to arrive in the promised land for 40 years. But on another level, we all know wanderers, don't we? People that feel like they're just not home. Folks in their 20s can feel this way a lot. You can't stay at home living in your parents' basement. That's right, kids, you have to move out. But you may not yet have found your mate or found your calling or found your own home or be able to afford it. And so you're in between this kind of wandering sense of where do I belong? I'm not really home anywhere. I know that my life is not meant to be doing this repetitive, low-paying job forever, just waiting for news about the next party. That's not sufficient. But I'm not yet where I'm going to be. I'm wandering in between. This can actually persist even beyond finding your mate or, your, or to the fact that there are some of us who are just job wanderers. I got a job, but you know what? I don't really like the people I work with very much. My boss is kind of a pain. Therefore, I have to leave working on the staff of First Presbyterian. No. <laughs> Therefore, I'm looking for something else. I want something more out of it. And you know those people, they can't stay anywhere more than a year or two. Their resume is really long. It's because they're wandering, restless, never quite finding it. You may know the intellectual wanderers, people who move from thought process to thought process. They hear about a book, and it's great, and they're all about atheism for a while. Then they're all about Eastern spirituality. Then they're all about Ayn Rand and the Fountainhead. That's amazing that stuff still works, but it does. And they're moving from philosophical thought to thought, wandering, and sometimes their very intellect prevents them from being home in one way of thinking. They're wanderers. Or we can be those who have wandered from the faith. We grew up knowing the truth, and yet we left it. We thought we could find life elsewhere and instead found nothing but death and dead ends. But we're still proud enough, still strong enough that we won't go home. We're spiritual wanderers. The community of God's people is made up of those who have been wanderers. And some in this room are still wandering. But the text tells us, the story says, then they cried out to the Lord in their distress. And he delivered them from their distress. He led them, God led them by a straight way to a city to dwell in. This is not just the difference between country lovers and city dwellers. It's the difference between being in community where you're home or being fundamentally, profoundly, soulfully alone and lost. They cried out to the Lord in their lostness. He led them home. There are people in this room who can testify that in meeting Jesus Christ, they met home, soul's home. We found ourselves settled in a deep way. It's not that we stopped doing anything in our lives, but that just at the bottom of it, we stopped feeling so empty, so lost, so lonely. There are people in the room who will testify that God led us when we thought we'd never love again to the love of our lives. There are people who will testify that God led us to a meaningful work in a community of people about which we can care and to whom we can contribute. And we realize we are the redeemed of the Lord. Well, the psalm says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you've been redeemed ever from wandering, raise a hand and say amen. amen. There's some wanderers here who've come home. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Well, the second vignette, the second story, has to do with some people who were imprisoned. It says, some sat in darkness in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and in irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God. This group of folks wasn't just wandering, they were actively rebelling. This is all of us who have known what is right and what is good and chosen deliberately against it and then suffer 
the brick wall of consequences. I don't even have to ask for hands there who's done that. We've all done that. I know better, God. I'm going to do it my way. And we slam into ramifications. Maybe it was the time you cheated on that test and didn't think you'd be caught. You failed the class. Maybe it was the time you plagiarized and got kicked out of school. It happens, even among Presbyterians. Maybe it was the time you fudged the figures at work to make the end of the year report come out all right, and someone did find out, and you lost your job and your reputation. Maybe it was the time you hit someone when you were driving drunk. Maybe it was actually breaking the law of the land, being tried, convicted, and imprisoned. We know what it is to suffer consequences for wrongdoing. Prisoners in irons, literally. But also, since the sin of our first parents, we're all in a particular kind of prison. What Paul called the bondage to decay. That's a fancy way of saying everybody falls apart. We are all unraveling. Everyone is on a collision course with mortality. We're going to die. Death hangs over the human race like bars in front of a prisoner. There's nothing we can do about that. We will die. It's our prison. Work can feel the same way. Even in a high compensated jobs, we can feel like I'm just a prisoner here. Talk to a doctor who says I'm a slave to these waiting rooms. I go out of one into the other and into another. Or a teacher in a classroom. You can be locked in because work has become toil because of our sin. And so we have to work hard ground to get a living. It feels like imprisonment. They cried to the Lord in their distress. He delivered them from this distress, and he brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and burst their bonds apart. Our God specializes in breaking prison bars. Some of us here have known what it is to get second chances, literally, to get let back into school when you were booted, to get let back into employment when you lost your job for cause to get let out of jail and restored to a community of free people. We've seen God do that kind of deliverance, and it's marvelous. We've also seen God deliver us spiritually. When I first arrived here, I got letters from a man named Jack Wilson. He's a member of our church who was put behind bars, justifiably so, and for a long time. But in prison, Jack discovered the freedom of forgiveness in Christ. He would often write back about sermons or ask for books and ask for prayer because he was getting older and his health was failing him. But even in the midst of knowing he wouldn't have much time when he got out of jail, Jack knew the freedom of being connected to Christ. When he got out of jail in his 70s this past spring, Whitney and I had a sweet time of prayer with him. But Jack got released from prison to a nursing home and now from that prison to being home with the Lord, he's passed on. But before he left, he knew freedom in Christ. We hear this from people who work in prison ministry with Cairo's program in Angola, that even people who will never get out can know the inner freedom in Christ. We can know it as well about the fact of our mortality. For the Christian, death changes even though it's inevitable. I heard a story about a pastor who was with his family in a car and they pulled up to a light on a sunny day and suddenly a shadow came across the entire car and one of the children actually shivered because it got so dark. A huge truck had pulled up beside the car. The dad wisely said, isn't it great to be under the shadow of that truck instead of under the full weight of it? That's the difference for the Christian about death. Death will come to us, but we experience it as a shadow. It sends a chill through us, it covers us, but we don't feel the full weight of it anymore. Because the hope of resurrection, of the Christ who has shattered the bronze bars of death, belongs to us. It's a shadow, it's not a crushing weight. 
They cried out to the Lord. He delivered them from their distress. And so the psalmist called upon the Lord, the people of the Lord, to say so about their redemption. Give me that next slide. I think we've got it. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of men. Watch this. For God shatters the doors of bronze and cuts in two the bars of iron. If you've been redeemed from the shadow of death, from bronze bars in your life, raise a hand and say amen. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. God has redeemed us from those bars. The third one gets even messier. Take a look at this story. Some were fools through their own sinful ways. Because of their iniquities, they suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. I wonder, how did the psalmist know what was going on in the 21st century Western culture 3,000 years ago? How did he get that? Because all I can think of when I read that passage is what's happening to our young people. So many eating disorders, so many self-harmers, children raised with the best of health care and the picture of health whose own bodies are turning against themselves because of the inner wounds they're trying to deal with. Through our own choices, sometimes we have compromised and destroyed our very health, loathing even the food that sustains. People who are addicted to alcohol or pain pills or cocaine understand what can happen when the addiction becomes so great that the body actually turns against itself. And what we seek to relieve the symptoms is actually continuing to harm us. We are locked in to dreadful patterns. The same is true in these, in these eating disorders. The same is true in the very way we live our lives as modern people. With all this freedom, we're yet stressed to the max. Scarfing junk food so that we no longer even want to eat what is healthy for us. Staying stressed so that our hearts are always strained and tight. Running ourselves into states of fatigue because we're pushing, pushing, pushing. We begin to even loathe what is good and draw near to death by our own choices. We read that they cried out to the Lord. They cried out to Him in their trouble and He delivered them from their distress. He sent His word and he healed them from their destruction. There are people in this room who know what it is to be delivered from the imprisonment of alcoholism and pornography addiction and gambling addiction. These very apparent problems that you'd say, oh, we're all too sophisticated for that. We're not tripped up by those things. Yes, we are. And yes, there are people among us who have been redeemed from eating disorders from living full out for the wrong things until our health was compromised. We are those sitting here who know the miracle that the body forgives what we've done to ourselves. Through the gift of medicines and counselors and therapists and prayer partners and the Lord's power above all, we are those who know what it is to be restored and clothed in our right mind. If you have been delivered from destructive ways, let the redeemed of the Lord lift a hand and say, Amen. He has indeed redeemed us from the pit of despair. Okay, one more. Let's go on to the next one. These were the people who went down to the sea in ships. Such a great poetic line. Some went down to the sea in ships, doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, His wondrous works in the deep. These were those who did big business in the world, who knew the miracle of global commerce. Perhaps they were taking ships across the Mediterranean Sea, carrying goods all across the known world. Well, we understand that, don't we? You can wake up and have a Skype conference with one of your associates in South America. You can figure out the time change and talk by cell phone to your representative in China. You can ship goods all around the world and stay connected to people by computers. It's a miracle of commerce. Do you ever sit down and look at the meal that you're eating and actually think about where it's come from? 
that you can sit and have a normal meal that you bought at the grocery store and realize it came from thousands of miles away, all kinds of different places, and the number of human hands that have touched it, and the ships and the trucks that have carried it, and the people who put it out, and the people who bagged it, and you're buying it. Each meal that you take is a miracle of modern commerce. It's astounding what happens. And we can begin to think we are so powerful, so self-sufficient, so productive. But what these men discovered is that when they went down to the sea in ships, their great and mighty vessels were like corks just floating on a stream. When the Lord sent the storm, the ship heaved about like it was nothing. The people who live on the Gulf Coast know this, don't we? We can do big business along the Mississippi, but then Katrina comes, or Gustav, or the BP oil spill, or God forbid the next hurricane, and we know as well as anybody on the face of the earth, we are nothing. All the power of our commerce can be destroyed in a second. Really all you need to know is the Baton Rouge interstate system to know that, right? A squirrel drops an acorn on I-10 and Perkins, Traffic stops for two days. Look at that. There's an acorn on the interstate. We must stop and see that. It is a mighty event. You've seen that. The infrastructure of our world, as great as it is, is incredibly fragile. We are nothing. These people in the distress of the storm cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and God delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still and the waters of the sea were hushed. You know what it is to cry out to the Lord in the storms of life? There are people here who will testify to the reality of being pulled off a rooftop or how if the accident had occurred three inches one way or the other, you wouldn't be here. Or even in this community, if the gunshot wound had been three inches one way or the other, I wouldn't be here. We understand miraculous deliverance. We also understand that we're not always spared from those things. And we've understood what it is to realize I am not in control of anything. If you've known that, you are favored by God. What would be worse than God leaving us with the illusion that I actually have power to make things happen in the world where it matters? I, on my own, invincible. Really? How long have you lived? What a mercy to fall to your knees and say, I am nothing. I control nothing. God, I can't, I'm helpless here. I can't change my death. I can't change accidents. I can't change violence. Only you are in control. And then the Lord says, now, now I can use you. Now you can see what I want to do with you. Now you can actually do something meaningful in the universe when you realize it's not about you. I saw on Facebook the other day, someone had a very dour picture of John Calvin, and it said, God's sovereignty, and underneath it said, sovereignty means God's sovereign, you're not. Relax. Get over yourself. We don't have to press so hard. God is in control of his world. If you have been redeemed out of self-sufficiency in your life and seen God's deliverance, raise a hand and say, Amen. We are the community of the redeemed. God calls us to offer a sacrifice of praise, to speak about his name. I love when I give an offering to think that way. It's not just paying the bills at the church. It's saying to God, this is a thank offering to you. You don't need it, but you give me grace to give it. I'll just confess to you, I mean, Rhonda and I give 95% of anything we give back to the Lord here to this church because this is where God meets us. This is our community. But sometimes we love to give a thank offering. After the wonder of our General Assembly production when the dancers did so much, I just thought, I got to thank God I need to send a check to, of moving colors for that ministry. <laughs> Amen. That name is Garland Goodwin Wilson. When we left North Carolina, we thought we need to give something to the ministry that gives food and shelter to the poor of this town as thanks. Not because I'm so great, but because it's such a joy to be able to say when I put a check in the plate, thank you, God. Thank you. I give this as a sacrifice of praise. 
We give it when we bring our bodies and put them in the pews and open our mouths and say, I want to be counted among the community of the redeemed. And everyone in here, I think, has raised their hand and said amen. This is God's community. He is well pleased with such a sacrifice. You could say, bottom line, the best witness of your life and therefore the point of your life is thanksgiving and praise to God for his redemption. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Can I get an amen? amen? Thank you, gracious God, for redeeming us, for calling us from the pit of emptiness. We bless you in the good times and the bad, for you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We bless you for your wonderful works to the children of men. Amen.